My name is Manuel Roman Lacayo. I am the Associate Director for the Center for Latin American Studies, and we are very excited to be part of this event, uh, which we hope will be a series that will recur every three weeks. Uh, Charlemos, uh, we hope uh, you find this interesting as we uh, find it. And uh, I just want to thank uh, to everybody uh, who uh, put together the initiative and brought it to our attention uh, from uh, the uh, political institutions process section of LASA. Uh, so once again, I will hand this over to Jennifer Sir, who will be uh, introducing uh, the event. Thank you very much. Thanks, Manuel. Uh, hi, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Jennifer Sear, and I am um, here in my capacity as the chair of the Latin American Political Institution section of LASA. We are the co-host of this series, and it's really a pleasure to see it come together in this way. Um, I would like to thank, in particular, um, the University of Pittsburgh Center for Latin American Studies, and especially um, Scott Morgenstern, who's done a lot of work to put this together. The sort of uh, early, the work early on to get everybody on the, a list has, has been quite a, a lot. Uh, and thanks as well to Maria Patricia Sotomayor, who's our research assistant and who's helping us um, put this all together. So I have a couple of things I want to say before we move into the actual charla. Um, just so you all know, the, the, this is called Charlemos, Let's Talk, the story behind critical research in Latin America. And the idea here was to bring scholars virtually together <laughs> to talk about new work that's either forthcoming um, or recently published, work that we think is especially pertinent, pertinent to what's going on in the region today. Um, so today we're going to be talking about democratic backsliding in the region. Um, and its inconsistencies. And we have another charla planned for three weeks from today. Um, and that will include Agustina Giraudi, Jennifer Pribble, and Sara Niedzvaiki, who are going to talk about a piece that they just published in America's Quarterly, looking at, at diverging responses to COVID in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. And we hope that our third encuentro will be about the constitutional reform in Chile. We're still organizing that. And then after that, we're, we're open to ideas that you may have. Um, we've already received a couple of proposals, but we would like to invite those of you who are interested in either sharing your work or new work, work that you're aware of um, to put together a proposal, which would include one or two speakers and potentially a host like me um, and the uh, relevant article or, or uh, uh, publication that, that it would reference. You can send that to the web, the email that we have um, that's currently operating called charlemos at pit.edu. Um, that email is on the flyer that we sent out today. Um, so please also remember to send an email there, charlemos at pit.edu, if you'd like to be included on a, a listserv that will automatically receive upcoming events that we're organizing. Let's move on to uh, our talk for today. I'm very excited to be here also as your host for this first Encuentro. Um, I would like to remind you of sort of the spirit of, of what will happen over the next hour. Um, the idea here is that I have a conversation with Javier and Fabrice about um, these two pieces that you've seen. I'll introduce the pieces in a second. Um, and to ask them questions about some of the choices that they made in terms of writing the article. As we all know, there is a lot that happens before an article gets written, much less published. So a part of my goal today is to understand a bit more of that backstory. And the idea of Charlemos is to talk about that backstory. Um, I also, of course, have questions about each article's broader implications. The idea is that the three of us have a conversation for about an, uh, a half an hour, and then we'll open up um, the charla to the rest of you should you have questions i invite you to put those questions in the chat okay so with that being said i'm going to introduce both of our participants and then i promise we will start to charla <laughs> okay so javier corrales is dwight w morrow 1895 professor and chair of political science at amherst college he obtained his phd in political science from harvard university um, his research focuses on democratization, presidential powers, democratic backsliding, 
the political economy of development, ruling parties, the incumbent's advantage, foreign policies, and sexuality. And he writes almost exclusively about Latin America and the Caribbean, and he writes frequently. Um, his latest book is called Fixing Democracy, Why Constitutional Change Often Fails to Enhance Democracy in Latin America. Uh, his most current article, however, is the one that we are discussing today, which is entitled Democratic Backsliding Through Electoral Irregularities, the Case of Venezuela. Um, it was published very recently in the European Review of Latin American and Caribbean Studies. This article, in brief, discusses how electoral irregularities contributed to back democratic backsliding in Venezuela during the Chavista era. Uh, from 1999 until 2019. And it also offers an interesting, I would say, fascinating typology of electoral regularities, irregularities, and their impact on oppositional behavior and the regime overall. Next, we have Fabrice Lehuk, who is a professor of political science at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. He obtained his PhD in political science from Duke University. His research focuses on the origins and breakdowns of political systems, electoral fraud and reform, the operation of democratic institutions, and political economy. He has also written extensively on Latin America, especially Central America and Bolivia, and is author of the forthcoming book, Political Instability and Its Legacies, Regime Trajectories in Latin America. Today, we'll be, we will be discussing his article called Bolivia's Citizen Revolt, which is forthcoming at the Journal of Democracy. The article examines the events that led to the end of Evo Morales' government in Bolivia and offers an analysis in general of the factors that may keep an incumbent with autocratic tendencies from further centralizing power. Okay, that's it. That's all I have for introduction. So let's get to the charla. So my first question is going to be directed to both of you. Um, I, I, you know, you both have written extensively about Venezuela in the case of Javier, Bolivia in the case of Fabrice. And so I'd love to have a sense of your background in each country. Um, neither of you are from either country. And so how, how, you know, why did you start studying this country? How often have you been there? What kind of field work have you un undertaken on the ground? What kinds of data have you collected? So just give us a background in terms of your experience in these countries. I'll start with Fabrice and then we'll move to Javier. Uh, hello everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I've I had the great fortune to travel every year to Bolivia since essentially 1994. I married to someone from Tarija um, and we go every year for Christmas. It's a wonderful time to visit southern Bolivia in a great wine growing uh, region of the world, I must say. And being a political scientist and liking what I do, I go every year and ask people questions and buy books at the bookstore. And one thing led to another. And as we know, Bolivia's had a great deal of political turbulence in its history and understanding instability, military coups, the, the exit from instability, the consolidation of democracy is the central theme of my research. It's not surprising that I started writing pieces and the first piece that I wrote was actually for the Journal of Democracy too, that I think was published in 2008, and which was about how the MAS got to the presidency, and what I call was a constitutional breakdown. Um, and then fast forward 14 years later, uh, I'm sitting in North Carolina, and we see an election that turns out to be very close. And this was a remarkable thing for me intellectually because my, my PhD dissertation, a big chunk of it, was about the 1948 election in Costa Rica, which was also a very close election, which led to a civil war and led to regime changing events. And then in my lifetime, and for many of the other people on this link, watching the meltdown in the US in 2000, for me that was a rerun of what I saw in Costa Rica in 48 and also 1924, but I'll spell you the details. And then in 2019, I saw this rerun in a country that I've learned to love and I've learned a few things about. So it was an easy thing to start taking notes to hearing how my wife's family reacted to this, mm -hmm. talking to lots of other people, reading lots of newspapers, 
to have that all congeal into an argument. Um, I stopped going to Venezuela. I used to go a lot and that was very sad for me and I don't want to go into the details, but I just don't go anymore. And this is one of the costs of democratic backsliding, if you ask me. Um, but whereas Fabrice was talking about closed elections, I was interested in governments making sure that they don't have closed elections. Um, there was um, an, a question that emerged for me, theoretically and empirically. The theory is, um, we know that democratic backsliding occurs by erosion of liberal democracy and participatory democracy, but we didn't know exactly what is the connection with declines in minimal democracy. And I said, there is a process here that happens as well. And empirically, you might, many of you might remember people saying things like, well, you know, Chavez um, might be having all these democratic problems, but at least he is preserving democratic institutions. Thank and you. I knew that that wasn't a clean story. And um, I wanted to um, uh, tell the story of how exactly a regime can engage in democratic backsliding, not just by undermining liberal institutions of democracy and participatory institutions of democracy, but also electoral institutions. And so I took the body of work that political scientists, as well as international organizations, as well as organizations of civil society that they have created to observe elections. And I tried to systematize them. I don't know if I did a good job, but I said, let's see if we can come up with a series of guidelines and there are 15 there. And I try to check uh, um, to see uh, which of those violations occur for every electoral contest. And um, that's what motivated me to write the paper is uh, once I gathered all this information, what kind of trends I, I, I saw. That's great. Yeah, I, I was actually um, heading now to, to the actual paper itself. Um, so both of you, I know, have extensive uh, traveling experience uh, in these countries. And I, I do think it's interesting and, and often sometimes important to highlight personal connections that we have, because it, I think it definitely drives it definitely drives our choices in terms of what we study. Um, and I, and I, I personally think it's great to, to have more transparency, transparency on that front. Um, okay, but let's talk about the article. So, so Javier, you started talking about the data you had collected, and I wanted to get into sort of the methodological choices that you had each made for writing these articles. Um, I do want to start first um, with Javier on this point, because you collected um, quite a bit of original data looking at each election and, and potentially the irregularities that were there. So I guess I would just like to hear a little bit more about the process in terms of how you, how you went about sort of finding this data, uh, any difficulties that you had, what you've since learned, perhaps it goes beyond this article if you'd like to share, please. So fortunately, um, this is the kind of research that is, can be done um, even from your own office because luckily, even in countries that are undergoing democratic backsliding, you typically have reporters, as well as local organizations that will produce reports about elections. And I was especially focusing not so much, of course, on data on electoral irregularities on election day, but right. uh, the campaign process. And this gets, this gets very well documented. There are questions as to whether people are over-exaggerating or undercounting, but at least many of these events are checkable. And that's what I did. But um, I, I have to say, sometimes the problem is, of course, that there is a lot, but it is, uh, uh, it is I think, absolutely doable. OK, great. So this is all secondary sort of online yes. information. Great. Um, Fabrice, I, I, I know this is a, a different sort of article, right, in terms of um, what, you're, what you're doing, right? This is a journal, journal of Democracy piece, and um, you're talking about the process, right, around sort of really giving a, a sort of a descriptive analysis of what happens in Bolivia uh, during a little bit before and after the election. Uh, 
But nonetheless, I think with these kinds of accounts, you have to sort of make an, choose an angle, right, to sort of frame the piece. And I'd love to get a sense of why you chose to frame the piece as you did. Just as to recall to everyone, the article is called um, Bolivia Citizen Revolt. Um, I would say I've, I've always been a student of political institutions and strategic behavior. So the article is framed upon the choices that government and opposition make and that different other actors make. And in, in this case, it was pretty straightforward. There's Evo Morales' government, which at one level is unified, at another level is not, just like any other government, and the opposition, which was even more fragmented. So it was easy for me to take the approach of looking at the key political actors and understanding something about the institutional as well as the non-institutional context they were involved in. And something that I did, um, kind of echoing, kind of offering a counterpart to what Javier just discussed, is I read several newspapers every day, Pagina Siete, La Razón, and BBC Mundo, plus of course the New York Times, and there was a fair amount of international media. And something that I tried very hard to do in my piece was to verify everything that could be controversial with multiple sources. So even though I didn't cite everything that I read, part of what I did was to verify, because I do take a stand on some controversial issues in the piece, mm -hmm. like whether there was a coup. I don't think there was a coup, and I will discuss it, I'm sure. Uh, and to just reach the point of saying that what's really important about Bolivia is the citizen revolt. So one of the things I gradually morphed into concluding was that you understand what happened in Bolivia? Look at what happened in Serbia in 2000. That is when a long-term incumbent tries to hang on to power and how to frame that issue. And I think that's one of the things I did. So I did some comparative analysis too, which is what my training as a political scientist helped me to do. Great, so I think this is really interesting because both of you did sort of collect the data um, from your, ostensibly from your desks at home, right? And this is important for two reasons. One, it's difficult to travel to some places where, you know, our security is potentially threatened, right? And so we may, we may make a choice not to go there as, uh, but also now more than ever, <laughs> collecting data from the safety of our homes, it seems to be sort of what we have to think about doing moving forward. So Fabrice, you talked about, you know, sort of looking for ways to, um, multiple sources, let's say, to, to think about how to uh, support controversial claims you were making. Um, Javier, do you, I was, I'm just curious it, what you did to sort of help um, feel sure that the evidence you were collecting via newspapers, um, you could be confident in that data. Uh, me? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, no, it was a very similar process to Fabrice. I wanted to make sure that several outlets um, uh, uh, confirmed the data. Um, it needed to be um, something that, or maybe a very reputable organization mm -hmm. uh, reported. So, um, so if it was a newspaper article, I made sure that there were other, um, other, other uh, confirming sources. But if it was a reputable organization, I would just go with it. Great. Let me also yeah. just quickly add that something that I did, and I suspect Javier did it here for this project and has probably done it for many other projects, is I called people throughout October, November. And I, I went to Bolivia in December, and I went with a list of questions on a notepad of things I wanted to double check. And then once I had a draft of the article and I was going back and forth with the editors, I also made a couple additional phone calls. So I tried to really draw upon 26, well, almost 30 years of going to Bolivia annually, a library, and doing these sorts of things. And I think one of the interesting things about the world in which we live now is when I was an undergraduate, and I should say with a great deal of pride, I was an undergraduate at the University of Pittsburgh, which is hosting this event. Um, if you want to do this sort of research, you'd have to go to the field. You'd have to go regularly just to find out what was going on. The, this online world has made that important, but I think important for different reasons, that there's so much more we can do
through the internet, through, especially with social media and with newspapers being online. Yeah, I think I think also, um, and I'll ask you to respond to this, that um, especially in Venezuela, and I think increasingly in Bolivia, or maybe it's been this way for a long time too in Bolivia, you know, a lot of our sources are not as quote unquote neutral as we would like, right? We have to sort of question that always. And there's a certain amount of knowledge that has to go into to knowing that as well, right? Well, which paper is this coming from? Which, well, what, what is this paper typically, you know, a lot of newspapers in Latin America sort of seem to take positions. So this is a part of sort of how we know what we know, I think, in collecting data. Something else that I did in this is I circulated drafts of my paper to friends more sympathetic to Evo's government and less sympathetic to Evo's government. And I listen very carefully to the points of contention, especially if I find myself having different priors. I went out of my way to listen and to try to take the other person's point of view on this. So I, I acknowledge what's there. Because I, I think a very important motivation for my piece, I don't want to inflame, I actually want to do quite the opposite. And my, my, my normative goal in this project and, and in the, the work that I've published on Bolivia is a reflection about how do we build a constitutional democracy? How do you create stable institutions and Bolivia is a great case for the lack of institutionality for much of its Republican history and the attempt over the past 40, 50 years to create a more constitutional democratic polity. So for me, the point of my research is to really understand some deep questions about that and to, and to take advantage of this great opportunity I have that every year I go to Bolivia and there's just a lot I've learned just by listening to other people in cafes, friends, people who disagree with me, people agree with me. It's, it's been great to learn that way. Great. Okay, well, let's go to some of the uh, meat, some of the more controversial claims, at least in the, in the case of Favadis, um, which you already suggested. But uh, so I, I think I like the art. I like that you're sort of pretty upfront in terms of the fr how you're framing this, right? This, the title is pretty clear, The Citizen Revolt. Um, I would be remiss, however, if I didn't ask you to talk a little bit more about your, your decision in terms of how you describe, and I try to use as neutral as a language as possible, um, Morales is leaving power. <laughs> Very passive voice. Uh, I have my own uh, uh, you know, opinion of this, but the, I, I'm, not, I'm totally leaving that out. because. But, but I do think there's a debate, right? I think... Um, uh, you do not call it a coup very clearly, and you talk about why it's not a coup in the piece. Um, and I, this is a pretty divisive point, I think, as you'll recognize. Um, there are many Bolivian scholars who are divided on this. Uh, Fernando Mayoga just came out with a book pretty recently, and different chapters take, have very different perspectives. Um, and then there are non-Bolivian scholars who study Bolivia who also are, are pretty divided on this. Um, so uh, I'd like to know how you came to the decision that you made in terms of was it a coup was an adequate. By the way, I should say that um, when I say this is a divisive point, I mean that people are very, very, have very, very strong opinions about this one way or the other. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, I'm in the middle of finishing a book project that's gone on for too long on instability <laughs> in Latin America. You alluded to that in the introduction. And part of what I've done for that book is to assemble a database of 340 coups in Latin America since 1900. So this is something, a coup is something that I've spent a lot of time observing. In so you've operationalized it, I would imagine then. Yeah, and I try to use the standard operation, which a military coup is when military officers overthrow the executive. So that's different, you know, from an auto golpe, what Fujimori did in, in Peru in, in 1994 or 1992, 94, I don't know why I'm forgetting the exact date. That's where he closes. 92. Yeah, 92. He closes Fujimori Plus's Congress with the help of the support, the acquiescence at least, of the Peruvian military. That's not a golpe. That's not a coup. That's an auto golpe. That's or an incumbent takeover, to use the expression that I like that Milan Slovic developed. So Let's apply that definition to what happened in October, November last year in Bolivia. Um, and let me add that there are military coups where the military puts a gun to the president's head, 
metaphorically speaking, and says, sign your resignation. And those are still coups because it's very clear what's going on. And part of what you do as the analyst is you look at the sources and you try to figure out if that's what happened. Well, if we look at what happened in Bolivia in, October, in November of 2019, that's not what happened. And if you, look at the, if you look at the newspaper trail, if you look at what social media was report, if you look at the news, right, this was contemporary history, if you like, right, we were living in the moment, is the military did not rumble in the streets. That's not what happened at all. Essentially what happened is there's this large protest organization. Again, think of Serbia in 2000, where there's a controversial election, citizens mobilized. They say no. I'm summarizing a great deal here. And if you've ever read Gene Sharp and all other theoreticians of nonviolent revolution, what they say is that people should organize to fragment the ruling bloc, to, to encourage the police and the security force and more broadly to defect. And that's exactly what happened. The police defect and the military essentially tells Evo Morales, we're not going to do your dirty work. We know if we went out onto the streets, we could, we could try to help your government last longer. But they decided not to do that. So they remained loyal to the constitutional order as opposed to the government in turn. And in fact, the, Je or the, the Bol Bolivian military puts that in writing. That's one of the things that I cite into this piece. And that's why I say that this is more like Serbia in 2000 than a standard military coup. Now, let me just briefly refer to a counter argument. Some would say, well, but for Greece, the military did recommend that Evo leave. The police did defect. The police and the military refused to defend this government. Isn't that like a coup? Well, yes, I do see that point. But I think we're missing the larger point that this government lost the support of the majority of Bolivians. And in fact, the mass itself, if you look at that final week of Evo's existence in power, the mass essentially abandons his regime. They split right down the middle and they abandon his regime. So when the military says, maybe you should resign, it was a Sunday, he, I believe it's the 10th of November in which he resigns. This is essentially a done deal. The military has essentially decided they're not going to do what it takes to keep this government in power. And that's the fundamental difference here. And I think we can do a contrast with what happens in Venezuela, I think, or what happened last year in Algeria, where the military stands behind the government and either uses violence or doesn't use a lot of violence, but it's clear that it's not going to abandon the regime. In Bolivia, again, I think it's an oversight to focus on those couple of things and ignore everything else that's going around. It's, it's an interesting counterfactual um, because I wonder what would have happened at that moment um, in terms of, because Morales does ultimately call for new elections to take place. Um, and if he hadn't, at the time, stepped down, if, let's say he, he, he felt the need to resign, would the military have uh, protected him <laughs> and protected the process because originally what the what the protesters seemed to want first they wanted their vote to be respected and then they wanted a, you know a runoff and then they and then they called for at least following in terms of what I've been reading they call for um, new elections and so he seemed to see this point right where so he hears the pressure from the streets la política de la calle which has always been so important in Boliv in the case of Bolivia it's it's an interesting counterfactual to wonder to see if the, the government the military would have you know supported Evo Morales in that position because by your logic they would have right because that would have been supporting the constitutional process but there you know there was that possibility one of the things. You know, if, if I was, if I would be a MAS advisor, I would be sitting with my sisters, is they always seem to be behind the eight ball. That is, Evo only called for a new election at the very end, yeah. when it was very clear that this was over, that the citizen boycott, an urban-based movement, was, had successfully forced his government 
not to continue with its plan to convert a close election into a fourth term in office. If yeah. he had, you know, he had the opportunity for a long time to go to a runoff election, to do that electoral. He refused. They refused to take it, alleging that they had been victims of a fraud. And they started crying about a golpe from that very Sunday of the election, uh, October 20th, uh, October 2019. So he was always behind the eight ball. The option was for him to run to go to runoff. No one was saying that there shouldn't be a runoff. He refused. Um, thank you, Fabrice. Well, let's turn it over to, to Javier in the meantime, because I, I want to ask you sort of a question about um, uh, Electoral irregularities, which is what your piece is about. Uh, I think it was interesting because both of the articles underscore the role of electoral irregularities as sort of a key signal that leaders are not willing to leave office, right? Uh, and so this is not about necessarily an uneven playing field. It's about manipulation and potentially, although not necessarily, uh, as you point out, outright fraud, right? And it often begins before election day, as you also point out. Um, so it would seem that irregularities are fairly widespread, not just in Venezuela, as you mentioned, but in many places where maybe we wouldn't even expect it, right? I'm thinking of, of the wealth of literature on U.S. electoral law that shows that the act of voting is disproportionately much more difficult for some groups because of certain laws that are put into place, right? So for blacks and minorities, for example, for asking to have a voter ID tends to, be, to make it much more difficult for them to actually go to vote. But there are very few calls to, you know, or, or calls are very recent, let's say, to study democratic backsliding in the United States. So my two questions for you are the following. The first one is, how unusual do you think electoral irregularities are, even in electoral settings that we would broadly recognize as democratic? Um, so one example of this would be, do you have any data on whether these irregularities occurred prior to Chavez coming to power? So in the 19, uh, 1990s. Um, and then at what point, and you do talk about this in your text, which I really appreciate it, um, what point do irregular, irregularities become troubling or indicators of, of backsliding, right? Sort of to the point where it's hugely problematic for the regime, right? So using your own words, how do we know when electoral irregularities, be they legacy or election specific, how, how, how do we know when they're cumulative enough to suggest that regime change is uh, in effect and, and that in order to return to a democracy, we'd have to then change those electoral institutions, which is something that you talk about in your text. Yeah, um, great. Um, so um, I think what's so interesting about this research on electoral irregularities is that the system is so complex that you're never going to find a system that's 100% perfect or 100% irregular. And the fact that so many of them are in this gray area creates uh, a lot of debates. Uh, the losers will always focus on the irregularities and blame a lot on their, um, blame them for further losses. So all systems have some degree of irregularity. That is why I think it makes sense to talk about a progression or the evolution or how is it that irregularities compared to where countries came from as well as with international standards. And, and yeah, in Venezuela, there were irregularities and some elections were significantly contested. But what I think I document is a cumulus over the years that is unprecedented for Venezuela and for Latin America. And at that point, citizens and, and, and analysts need to make a judgment call because they're never, we don't have yet, theoretically, at least I haven't seen uh, a way to determine you've crossed a certain line. And this is why the title for this Charlemos is good because there is always inconsistency. Some parts work well, some parts don't, and, and creates enormous uh, uh, confusion. Now, I do have to say that when a system creates a systematic bias in the organization that is supposed to monitor elections, and on top of that, the judicial system is already pretty biased, I am inclined to say, you know, red flag, you've crossed a certain line. Now, not everybody agrees with that. A lot of people say you'll never have a fully impartial electoral authority. But that would be where I would go as uh, um, uh, uh, things that are already pretty significant. 
one could also use one could also use um, the oppositions. Um, the it's very important, and this is not a trivial indicator, to see that the opposition accepts the results, especially the losers. And um, and there were many elections under Chavismo where the losers actually accepted the results despite the irregularities. So there are a number of things to look at, but the point, Jen, you're absolutely right. It is very difficult to, with this kind of research, to uh, find a, a yes, no answer to this question of where is it that democratic backsliding occurs. Great, thank you. Um, I, I, I hope you um, look at and see what happens in the U.S. in the, in the upcoming months in terms of electoral irregularities. I think there's going to be a lot more. I, I do sometimes wonder, though, um, even not not intentionally, but just by in terms of pure mistakes, right? If if we, we would find electoral irregularities wherever we looked for them, because it feels like, and I, I think in Venezuela you document. I, I think it's 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 a convincing story. Certainly, I'm not I'm not in any way pushing back in that sense, but. You know, when I look at sort of was there fraud or not in the, in the case of Bolivia and the Bolivian election, it's, it, it seems like a lot of these mistakes happen uh, or could be highly contextualized, um, not mistakes, sorry, a lot of these irregularities could be highly contextualized or they could be simply mistakes. You know, I, 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 like you said, I think it'd be really hard to find a, you know, a clean, a fully clean election. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you can, I mean, it's important, it's very important to get to a point where the opposition trusts the process going into yeah. it. And in Bolivia and in Venezuela, they don't. And this is where we need to go. Because like you say, many of these irregularities could just be uh, accidents. Um, yeah. But the trust is in there. And this is, you know, as just as we can create trust uh, when you're talking about peacemaking, we have to be able to do it for elections. There are some people who say things like, electoral bodies have to be comprised of mostly opposition forces for example this is the only way that you're going to get a lot of trust not even a proportional representation but mostly opposition forces and they're the ones who have to be the arbiters as you go into elections that's perhaps and that's probably going too far but i think there's a sense that you want to create trust going in and both of these cases fail badly uh, regardless of what happened on election day. There's, and I would say something else to Javier's very good point, that once you start looking at the way elections operate, it's hard to find one that checks all the boxes. So we can say, this is a wonderful electoral environment and no one has an advantage. That's almost impossible to find for systemic reasons and also for accidental things that you've alluded to. But I would say, that we also want to make a distinction between elections where there are minor irregularities, mm -hmm. but where the candidate that won, there was really no doubt that he won. He might have won by 1% less, but he or she won. What allows a close election, to, what allows those irregularities to become explosive is when the results are very, very close. So for example, I think that one of the questions that I often think about for Venezuela as well as for Bolivia is what type of regimes that these governments run. And when you win an election by 10 or 15% of the vote, where it's clear from public opinion polls and other evidence that the incumbents are very popular, rightly or wrongly, but they have a lot of support, irregularities mean something very different in that case. But when, when that political force loses support, so it barely wins an election, that's where irregularities become explos explosive. And that's what happened in Bolivia in 2019, is that if we, you know, we spent time talking about the coup, but we didn't mention that the election of October 19th put Evo Morales not quite enough ahead to avoid a runoff. And the, the, the lead was so, so, so narrow. And there were enough irregularities in that election that that's where, that's what fueled the protests. And part of what I try to point out in my piece is that's what fueled the outrage by his opponents. I had heard a lot of his opponents for 15 years. I heard people liked him and people didn't like him in my trips to Bolivia. But what really, the straw that broke the camel's back was we knew he was going to do this, 
This is where he should be to run off, where we could potentially defeat him. And look what he's doing. Yet again, he wants, he doesn't want to uh, hold himself to competitive election. And it's important to state in this case that in 2016, in February of 2016, Evo Morales, the mass lost a referendum ask where they ask the voters, can we reform the constitution to allow Evo to run yet again? And a majority, a bare majority of voters said no. And in the next year and a half, the regime found a way to prevent that from happening and basically used a two thirds majority and that two thirds majority packing different parts of the state, the institutions of our horizontal accountability to allow him to run. And this was the mindset. So when Javier says part of what we need to look at is what's the trust the opposition has? Yes, we have to look at their perceptions and whether their perceptions make sense. So I understand why people would do this. Just again, the parallel is what happened in Serbia in 2000. Great. So this is a really good segue into my next question. You brought up the opposition here, and I want to bring up the opposition in both the case of Bolivia and Venezuela, but I think it's an interesting part of this story. Um, because I do think in the case of Bolivia, you know, that this, this referendum in, in February of 2016 really fueled the fire of the opposition, right? And, and gave them something very easy to organize around, right? Like my vote will be respected in a way that really the opposition hadn't really mobilized previously. Um, so my question has to do with the opposition in general, right? Because I think it, you know, I've done a little bit of work on the opposition in Venezuela and it took some years, but the opposition in Venezuela does finally organize and coordinate sort of an electoral, uh, sort of a unified electoral uh, um, uh, approach to trying to remove Chavez and then Maduro from power. Um, in Bolivia, we don't really see this happening year after year, no matter, you know, and, and Evo was in power for, you know, 14 years in Venezuela. Oh, okay. In Venezuela, the case was by, you know, by about 10 years in, you, you had the Mesa de la Unidad Democrática, which was finally created, and a previous attempt before that, right, under the Coordinadora Democrática. So I'm just curious, you know, what do, what, because the opposition also has a role in terms of, in the case of the Bolivia and the MAS, um, they had a two-thirds majority in both houses, which gave them quite a lot of liberty to, to take choices in terms of, you know, I, I wouldn't expect Trump to approve a Supreme Court justice uh, to replace Ginsburg, if that ever needs to happen, with somebody that you know the Democrats would necessarily support, right? So, how do we look at the opposition here? Why, in the case of Bolivia, um, so specifically to Fabis, why, in the case of Bolivia, has the opposition not organized until very recently under uh, not even necessarily a political party, but a, a rather polemic figure from the East? And in Venezuela, what's going on with the opposition now? And you know, how do we think about? how to organize under a fully authoritarian regime in, in this context. So Fabrice first and then Javier, thanks. It's, it's important to return to Bolivia at the beginning of the 21st century when the MAS and others began attacking the establishment. And to make a long story short, because there's lots of interesting things relevant for the subsequent political trajectory of Bolivia that we can't, don't have time to discuss. But it is important, one of the reasons why the MAS becomes such an important political force, remember in 2002, the first time Evo Morales runs for office, he comes in second place to Gonzalo Sanchez Rosado with, with around 20% of the vote. Three years later, fast forward from 2002 to 2005, Evo wins in December of 2005, 54% of the vote. And I remember in Bolivia in 2002, many people saw Evo Morales as a very dangerous political figure. And three years later, he wins this enormous mandate from the voters. So there's a fantastic question here. The short answer to why he wins is the establishment at that time screwed up, they collapsed. And I think we underestimate the role, especially, I don't, I, I'm, I'm ambivalent about the term populist, but these new political forces that end up rewriting political or reforming, changing political realignments, they win in part because establishment it destroys itself. And that's essentially what happens there. And then what happens in Bolivia between 2005 and 2016 is the opposition can compete 
And there were so many examples of this. They didn't have interesting candidates. But whatever you can say about the mosque, and there's lots of things to say about the mosque, is the mosque is referring to some age old schisms in Bolivia that a majority of Bolivians decided should no longer be the only structuring principles of their politics and their society. So there's a way in which there's this historical demands that the mass meets. And that's why it becomes popular. And the rivals of the mass don't know how to respond to this, in part because a fair number of them are part of the establishment that the mass is defeated. Now, I would say Carlos Mesa has always been not part of the establishment, not part of the, uh, not part of the mass. He's always been kind of the very liberal, mildly social democratic, someone who wants reform for his country, but doesn't quite agree with the mass for a number of different reasons. Some of it ideological, but some of it is. And I think this is something that the international analysis about the mass overlooks is from the late 20th century to 2005, the mass, the mass played, to use the term coined by Juan Linz, a semi-loyal gain with democracy with constitutional democracy. They erase the line, for example, between peaceful protests and subversion. I mean, I hate to use that term because I think the, the MAS does have lots of good ideas and it has some very important things to say for Bolivia's future, but they erased those lines. And once they got into power and they became very popular, there was always that debate within the MAS and there's still that debate. How do we rotate political power? How do we create other political leadership? How do we fundamentally rewrite the rules of the political game for a more just future in Bolivia? There's always been that debate between the two. So if you, you know, I think the, to quickly summarize is in 2016, the establishment found a way to congeal against the mass. And they figured something out. Now, let's see if that's going to persist. The big question is what's going to happen in the elections on September 6th. Javier, in my question to you about the opposition, um, both Jen, Jennifer McCoy's question and another question by Antonio Smith Bravo seem to speak to the opposition. So I'm going to put these out there now for you because I think they're sort of all related. So Jennifer uh, McCoy would like to know, um, in the article you analyzed opposition responses to electoral manipulation as well. Given the current circumstances, what do you recommend the opposition do for the upcoming National Assembly elections, where we see similar government controls as in the 2018 presidential election? So again, sort of what do we expect the opposition to do now? And then the second question by Antonio Smith Bravo, do you see a situation in Venezuela in which um, the nominally quote unquote opposition parties are essential for the survival of the authoritarian regime? That is, are co-opted parties playing the role of the opposition, such as what we saw with the opposition political parties in the German Democratic Republic? So answer all of that in just a few minutes, please. Sure, uh, no, um, great. Let me just say that one of the puzzles that I tried to address in my paper is, why is it that governments that have an electoral advantage still engage in electoral irregularities? The typical answer is to increase the margin of victory. Yeah. But I also suggest that it's intended to divide the opposition, at least between those who want to participate and those who are going to say the system is too rigged. So it's also to create this division. And essentially, this, do, th th this does occur. And the challenge for the opposition is to making sure that those who are like, forget it, the, the game is over actually participate. So uh, whenever you're in trouble, a government will engage in this uh, game in order to get folks in the opposition to feel like this is hopeless. Maduro is doing exactly that right now in preparing for a possible constitutionally mandated election for the national legislature, the National Assembly. They have already committed so many irregularities it's sort of like so out in the open and um, confronting again with the very same dilemma, many folks in the opposition saying, well, forget it. Yeah. My recommendation is, my recommendation is to do exactly what they did, which you mentioned, Jen, 
in 2016 when they came to the realization that the system was rigged, but they said, we're still competitive, we can still win, it's just going to be harder. Do not go, do not succumb to the temptation to not participate. Will they win? I don't know, but it's better to compete and lose in a rigged election than to say we're not going to compete because that just hands over uh, all the uh, triumphs to the uh, governing party. Uh, Antonio asked a very important question, which is for the first time, Maduro has created something that didn't exist under Chavez, which is let's actually divide the opposition with one set of parties becoming semi-Chavistas. Chavez didn't try this. Chavez, uh, and, and Maduro didn't try this until now, but uh, for the 2018 election and certainly for the, uh, 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 the re-election of uh, the president of the National Assembly, this is Maduro's new really clever strategy, which is to create, you know, in Mexico, this was the, the way that the PRI operated for many years, is that there was going to be an official opposition that was neither, uh, that was not that opposition. And this is a very difficult problem. This is very new for Venezuela. And it's one way in which Maduro is not just a replica of Chavez. These members of the opposition are uh, very co-optable and eager to accept terms that are so unfavorable to any actor other than the ruling party. And I don't know how uh, uh, the mainstream opposition is going to respond to that. The opposition in Venezuela is in a terrible um, state at the moment. I, I, some days I wake up feeling like, oh, they're going to be able to uh, come out of this. And some days I wake up thinking, eh, you know, forget it. Uh, in, uh, given the economic situation, the irregularities and the pandemic, it's over. But one day I'll feel different. <laughs> um, well, OK. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, from what I see, they're trying to sort of pick apart the opposition from within, right? Sort of replacing people that could be potentially... Yes. Um, yeah. They already did this. Uh, uh, um, and for the 2015 election, parliamentary election, they intervened in COPE. So this is not entirely new. It's just bigger now because they're doing it with three parties and possibly four. But uh, nevertheless, look at what happened in 2015. Despite the largest number of irregularities in 2015, the opposition had its biggest triumph. So, uh, okay, now I'm feeling much better about the opposition. Maybe uh, the fact that it's turning then so Then they were neutralized. Great. I'm sorry to... <laughs> well, the National right, Assembly I mean, was neutralized. I know, I know. But it was really a turning point in terms of yeah. um, switching the party system so that advantage opposition. It sort of forces the hand, right? Uh, yeah. I, think it'll be, I think it'll be interesting in the case of Bolivia. Um, hopefully elections will take place in September. Um, you know, from everything I've seen, the MAS still is the front runner. So I, I, there's a lot that still needs to be defined because I haven't been fully convinced that this government is as democratic as I'd like it to be either, right? So th this is a really tenuous time, I would say, but yeah. What I was going to stress is, you know, if you look at elections throughout the 20th century in Latin America and many other parts of the world too, one of the cudgels that the right uses against the left or certain parts of the left or tries to generalize is that the left is anti-democratic, the left is anti-constitutional. And there's a sincere critique of the left on that score. And then there's a critique of the left. So when Perón runs for office for the first time in 1945, the Argentine right accuses Perón of being a fascist, of being not democratic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a way in which that critique is insincere. So, and I think that's a very important point you want to make. Just if, just because we conclude, or I conclude, that Evo did not fall because of a coup, that it was a citizen revolt, I don't want to deny the fact that the political succession afterwards dented the constitutional order. And I think we should be very open about this. And that the denting of the constitutional order has culprits both in the mass. And in the opposition, you should not use the power of the streets to overthrow a government you dislike. The MAS did this at the beginning of the millennium. Now the opponents of MAS did it to the MAS, and the MAS gave them the justification for doing this. And then out of nowhere, President Yanina Añez comes to power. That's another story. And yes, she was supposed to lead a caretaker government, 
And at the end of January of this year, she decides she's going to run for office. That was, from the standpoint of promotion of constitutional democracy, that was not a good step forward. And there's some very conservative people around her who have less of a commitment to constitutional democracy and more of a commitment to protecting certain interests in Bolivia. So I'd like, this is from um, Scott, I'm calling you out, Scott Morgan Stern. I'd like Fabrice to talk about the current president, Agnes, and how the delayed elections affects democracy. I'll add to this, the fact that she was supposed to be a caretaker government and instead started to govern. Um, I think this is highly problematic. So Moss is the front runner, as I said, he's writing here, but they could lose in a second round if the opposition joins. So what, what sort of are the precedents of being set. And then we have another question for Fabrice, so I'll, I'll give this to you now. Um, why did the establishment fail or screw up, in your words, before the mass rose to power? More generally, if part of the reason why these insurgent candidates succeed is that the establishment fails, sort of why does the establishment fail, right? So we've, maybe we're seeing this again. In this case, the mass was the establishment, it fails, and so we see these other candidates search. So why does the establishment fail? Just quickly, again. All right, right. Very simple <laughs> questions to answer. Let me start with the first question. And just a couple of facts is that once Evo goes into exile, in November of 2019 goes to Mexico and he ends up in Argentina afterwards. There's the question of who's going to be president. Yeah. Well, you'd say vice president. Well, the vice president, Alvaro Garcia Limera, of another fascinating character that we don't have time to discuss, he also has resigned. And the president of the Senate, so this is the, the third person in the line of succession. The president mm -hmm. of the Senate is supposed to become president. Then it then it's the president of the lower house of Congress. Then it's the president of the Supreme Court. And in a very interesting thing is that the president of the Senate and the president of the lower house, both Masistas, the first vice, first vice president's Masistas, they resign. And when Evo leaves, there's this vacuum of power in the executive. And one can speculate that what the MAS was trying to do is create the Perona scenario of 1945, create a, a vacuum of power so that Evo would return. That didn't happen because they didn't count upon the, the current occupant of the executive uh, branch of government, Yanina Añez, who was the second vice president of the Senate, and she's a politician from an opposition party from one of the very small departments of Bolivia. And I think she never expected, nor did anyone ever expect her to become president of Bolivia. And in a very controversial mood, she decides to say, well, if the president of the Senate is left, the first vice president of the Senate is left, I'm in the line of succession, therefore I can become president because in 2001, the Constitutional Tribunal under the old constitution said, that's what could happen in this case. And there's a hornet's nest of constitutional issues. I really like constitutional interpretation, and we'll just have to put a bracket around that. And for two or three days, we don't know all the details about this, for two or three days, the OAS, the European Union, ambassadors, everyone's trying to convince the mass, go back to the Senate and go back to the House, because the mass had abandoned them and there was no quorum. And she, Agnes, decides to declare herself as president, and it sticks. And at first, there's a sigh of relief. And there's a very important thing is eventually the MAS returns to the Senate and to the lower house. And they begin cooperating with Agnes on emergency legislation, including, interestingly enough, letting her fill out Evo's term, which would be over, I think it's at the end of March of 2020. Because then they get to complete their terms too. So that's an important thing. The Senate and the lower house of the legislature, of the assembly rather, now in session, were the ones elected with Evo back in 2014. So the MAS, it's important to state this, the MAS cooperates with Agnes. They recognize her authority. It's not the military that's doing this. It's eventually the MAS that's doing all of this. Then the question, then at the end of January, she controversially decides, I'm gonna run for office because she's petrified that there's going to be a repeat of the October scenario. And she's very much of an anti-Massista, one of these, I would say, possibly emotional anti-Massistas. 
in, in, in the opposition in Bolivia. And then that quickly morphs into a situation where COVID becomes a problem and she conveniently, her critics say, and I think with some justification, oh, she wants to hang around longer using the threat of COVID to keep prolonging, postponing the date of a new election. And there are sectors of the opposition that want that to happen. She comes under a lot of attack by other sectors of the opposition and by the MAS. And to make a long story short, the, the TSC, the president of the electoral tribunal in Bolivia, by the way, who's one of us, Salvador Romero Valle mm -hmm. he's a political scientist. Mm -hmm. he, he, he promotes a multi-party understanding, which essentially forced Agnes's hand to hold the election September 6th. And there's no question her government, there's some very conservative elements of them, some of them who see their job as perhaps even exacting revenge on some of the mass, certainly moving public policy in a more conservative direction. Uh, there's no question about all of this. And I would add a healthy dose of this is she's an ex inexperienced political uh, operator. You know, I spoke with people who kind of were privy to some of the, some of the distant relationships is she blew it. She could have been a caretaker president and then five years from now, we're on as president, probably won. She decided to burn her status as a caretaker president of bringing the Bolivian family together in this quiotic search to become president. Now, there was something that Scott alluded to earlier that I want to make very clear now. The strategic situation that Bolivia finds itself in, the political strategic situation, is the MAS is the largest political force but it's not so clear that they can get over 50% anymore, at least for the time being. That means that the MAS will always get very close to winning the presidency, but according to Bolivian, the Bolivian constitution, the candidate needs more than 50% of the vote to win in the first round, or at least 10% more than the second, than the runner up, the first runner up, the second place candidate. And it's not very clear whether the MAS can win outright in the first round. And its candidate is Luis Arce, who was the Minister of Finance in Evo's government. And that means then that once it becomes very clear for the opposition that it's them or the MAS, they have powerful incentives at that point to congeal, to coordinate around the single opposition candidate. But between now and that point, Obviously, anyone with political ambition and a political following wants to be that candidate. In fact, the temptations are so serious that Agnes decides to pull this neophyte political move from my suggestion, from my perspective. Now, very quickly, I just say, you asked me the question, why do political establishments break? Um, that's a long story to get into now what I would say is by the end of the 1990s, by the beginning of 2000s, enough Bolivians had had enough with the post uh, or with the neoliberal political and economic order that was forged by Victor Paz in 1985. And there's always been a very powerful left in Bolivia and a lot of the left formed alliances with new social movements and with indigenous groups, and those congealed into the opposition to the establishment. And the establishment between the late 1990s and 2000, 2005 had one opportunity or another to shift to the center, to work with the center, to listen to what I would say legitimate demands by the opposition, and they largely refused to listen to them. Curiously enough, Carlos Mesa, was the vice president to uh, Sanchez de la Sala, who was overthrown essentially by the MAS through three protests in 2003. And Carlos Mesa understands the historical moment. He understands that he became a president. He was a powerful, very influential newscaster in Bolivia, someone that Gonzalo San Sanchez de la Sala, there is a figure of the political and economic establishment of Bolivia, brought into his government to send the signal that he was listening. He didn't listen. When the going got tough, 
after 2002, he didn't listen enough. And Carlos Mesa broke with Sanchez de la Salle in 2002, 2003. Carlos Mesa becomes president and Carlos Mesa makes a valiant effort, I would say, to go to the center to do a lot of social reforms. But that's where you have the MAS, which is not interested solely within working within the system. They're interested in a new Bolivian revolution. There, a big part of the MAS is completing the Bolivian revolution of 1952 that's overthrown in the military coup in 1962. And fast forward, they don't want a compromise, much less with someone like Carlos Mesa. They want to be in control. And at one level, who can blame them? I think the criticism that I have or the questions I have is they were winning the electoral game. Why did they play this double-edged sword game? And I think that's part of when we think back about what Evo means for Bolivia, one of the really interesting things was Bolivia at the beginning of the new millennium was not Bolivia in the early 1960s where too much social reform might provoke a military coup. Bolivia was an utterly different place at the beginning of 2000. And so it's, it's really quite ironic that in 2019, Evo leaves office the same way he got in. Well, he was elected. Quite, quite amazingly in 2005. And many people, it's hard to tie the math to the, sorry, I have to, it's hard to tie the math to the protests that happened previous, right? A lot of the social bases of support were, but, but Evo was not certainly leading the, a lot of the, the protests that were happening in the early 2000s. Certainly not at read, all. I, I would say, <laughs> Jennifer, go back and read the historical record. Go back, look at it. And I invite everyone to do this. I always find it very interesting that in a lot of these, accounts of the great achievement that the MAS did by winning power and trying to refound Bolivia, that we go from the protests, legitimate demands, to ever winning an election. But nobody really wants to look at that period from the late 19, from the late 20th century, especially at the beginning from 2000 to 2005, look at what the MAS did. They played semi-disloyal game. They played within the political system, yeah but they also subverted it. They also, yeah, sure. Okay, well, this has been really fascinating. And now we're at sort of past time. Um, I really want to thank both of our uh, speakers today, Fabrice and Javier. I thought this was a really fascinating talk. I thought it was a great inaugural event. Our next event will be in three weeks. It will be uh, with um, Agustina Giraudi, Sara Nid Nid <laughs> Nidviaki, and Jenny Pribble, who just recently put a piece out in America's Quarterly about divergent responses to COVID in three different federal countries in Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina. Uh, also, there's a new LAPS issue, Latin American Politics and Society, where uh, Pribble and Hidaudi have an article that was just published that deals with this as well. So it's going to be a really topical, obviously, since we're all stuck here virtually looking at each other on a screen. This is a very topical conversation, um, but one that takes sort of an institutional approach to understanding why these responses have been so different. It's a fascinating piece in America's Quarterly. It will be circulated before the event. Thanks to all of you uh, for participating. I will ask you to sign up to the Google list for sure, because we'll probably use that list to allow for invitations moving forward. Um, and again, my great thanks to uh, Javier, Fabriz, uh, the Latin American Studies Center at Pitt, uh, Patti Sotomayor, who is helping us with research, and of course, Lapis for their support. Thanks everyone. Take good care.